Ooh, welcome in the latest episode of that SEC podcast. I'm your host, Michael Bratton. I go by SEC Mike on Twitter. And I'm joined, as always, by my cousin, Shane, who goes by Big Orange Balls on Twitter. What are you up to, you big Tennessee homer? <laughs> hey, buddy, what's going on? Oh, almost forgot man. my beer, man. I, I was like, <laughs> I was just sitting there. I was like, I feel like I'm forgetting something, you know, like you leave your keys at the house or something. I was like, oh shit, the beer, you know? <laughs> well, Hey, don't have too many Shane. Cause don't forget Saturday. We're wrapping up spring football in the SEC. So I'm pretty yep. fired up. I want to see Alabama. I want to see LSU. They're kicking off uh, this Saturday to, to close out the spring. And we have got, some potential big news brewing in Tuscaloosa. We'll get to that in a minute. We got my buddy Stefan Kreisnik. I, no. I screw up his name. Say every that time. ten times fast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> From the Clarion Ledger, deep dive on Mississippi State. We've had so many Mississippi State fans, Shane, saying you ain't talking enough Bulldogs. Well, we got Steph on the line. Great interview talking Mississippi State. And this hotline is blowing up, Shane. So we got some questions on the hotline. We're gonna get to that in all that, but how you doing, brother? Man, I'm doing great, man. I, I, I was I was joking with uh, the wife earlier. It's like a, a brisk 98 degrees outside, you know? I was like, <laughs> man, we went straight from winter to August, man. It feels like football, you know what I'm saying? So yep. uh, uh, be ready. I think we got a couple stores coming in, but it was really nice to enjoy some of that sun and uh, get ready for summer, you know? It's upon us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no doubt. So, Whew, it's going to be a crazy one out there, Shane, but uh, man, we got a wild show, and like I said, potentially big news out of Tuscaloosa, and this is not you know, one or two people. I'm hearing this from a mm-hmm. lot of different people, Shane. We kind of teased it earlier in the week, and there appears to be serious um, legs to this rumor. That, that's what it is mm-hmm. at this point in time, a rumor, but uh, we've been saying Hey, it doesn't sound like they're too fired up about their quarterbacks on Saturday. There's no chance in hell Nick Saban is going to address this, uh, I wouldn't think. And who knows, maybe Jalen Milrow, maybe Ty Simpson, maybe they light it up. And for Alabama's sake, I hope they do. But continue to hear that uh, they're not exactly thrilled with their prospects at quarterback. And the rumor is, Shane, ready for this one, Mm -hmm. transfer portal addition likely on the way via not Drake May, who a lot of people, that was the guy, remember Shane, there was multi-million dollars on the table allegedly for him. It's not Mm -hmm. Drake May, it's warmer. Warmer. Miami quarterback Tyler (laughs) Van Dyke is the rumor where apparently he's, you know, considering leaving Miami. And again, they're not going to add this guy before the spring game or anything. I mean, that would be... That would be wild if they did, but but who knows, Shane? I mean, the, the way this thing is happening, it sounds like by Sunday, by Monday, Alabama could have another quarterback. You know, it may not even be this guy. But let's just say they add somebody. Mm-hmm. Does that change anything for you for the upcoming season for the Alabama Crimson Tide? Does that give you more confidence, less confidence? What's your thoughts on that? I don't, I don't know. I think the, the knee-jerk reaction is, okay, this is improvement. You know, this is – you know, Saban and company saw something that needed to, you know, or maybe there was a problem with the current quarterback situation. I mean, we're going to, we're going to get a a closer look at that Saturday, but you know, obviously there's been these rumors floating around. Now you've got the Miami guy coming out saying he's not happy with the NIL deal that he's got. And, you know, I mean, it's almost like it's, you can read, you know, between the lines there. So yeah, it does, an adding another quarterback to the Alabama roster help or hurt? I think it helps, clearly. I mean, this is one of those things that we, we talked about in Ole Miss where where Dart stepped up, you know, maybe mm-hmm. maybe that's maybe that's kind of what they need down there in Alabama. They need a third quarterback to come in to to strengthen that room in the competition. So I'm not discouraged if I'm a, a tied fan that we don't maybe have our quarterback on the roster, but uh, 
you know, the, the kid in you always wants to say, well, you know, the grass is greener. So, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe bringing this guy in will, will get us to another national championship. So it sounds like you're not a big believer in the old adage, Shane. If you, if you got two, two quarterbacks means you don't have a one. You, you're, you're sitting here saying, if we, if we got three, we got us a winner here. Yeah, I don't know. I'd... I'm the complete opposite, Shane, because, I mean, there's only so much you can do with a guy in the summer. You know, you, obviously yeah. you get your hands on them in, the, in training camp a month before the season. I, I don't know how advanced Tommy Reese's system is, but it, that's my understanding. I mean, this is pro style. Um, it's, this is not something you just kind of can come in and master in, in a week or a month. So yeah, I, don't, I, I don't know. That, this concerns me, Shane. This, this is telling me that they don't have a quarterback right now and, and they're reaching to, to bring one. Because, again, this Van yeah. Dyke, he was getting hyped this time last year, but he was not that good last year. But, but again, you can, I always, I'm thinking more like Georgia here. You know, you go out, you get JT Daniels, and everybody thinks, okay, this is our guy. And then what is what happens? You know, the guy that's already on the roster wins the job in a two national championship. So, right. yeah, maybe maybe that's what it what you need is to say, you know, get these guys uncomfortable down there. So I, I'm not. I'm not just throwing it all out with the bathwater, but I, 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 I'd like to think that this is a strategic move to make that quarterback room more competitive. And I don't necessarily think that the, the Miami cat's going to win the job. If he comes up here, you know, could it happen? Absolutely. And I think there's going to be a lot of people wanting to pull the trigger. If, if Bama starts out slow, which he, they probably won't. So mm-hmm. I, I think your quarterback, your starting quarterback is still on that roster right now. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll find out <laughs> soon enough, Shane. And who knows? This may all be speculation. Maybe one yeah. of these guys shine. Maybe they don't even add anybody via the, via the transfer portal, but there's a reason we brought it up. Cause this has been brewing. And it, as we get closer and closer to Alabama spring game, this thing is heating up. So it's just fascinating that the transfer portal opened back up and Bama still yeah. had a week of practice. So woo-hoo. I think it's just wild that it's been so long since we've worried about quarterback play in Alabama. It just seems like you've yeah. always had one. And this is the first time that we don't. And we're, I'm not saying panicking. I, I think there's that, that's what a lot of us media want to do. But, you know, it's just kind of, it's just kind of curious how this thing's playing out. So I'm, that makes that spring game even, I'm sure it's going to get bumped to ABC before it hits Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Chase, so let's get uh, let's jump over to our hotline. And again, we got so many of these messages piled up. Cannot thank you guys enough for giving us content here. Uh, the next couple weeks after spring football, it's going to be dead until they announce the, uh, the new scheduling format. So we need questions, and we got one here from our guy Joe from Pennsylvania. He's a big South Carolina fan. But before we get to his question, let's throw out that hotline one more time, Shane. 615-965-5152. We've got uh, a personalized voicemail on there. So you'll know you're talking to us when you reach that number. Leave us leave us your name. Leave us a message. Yeah. And we're happy to play it on the show. Um, and just like we're going to do with this uh, Joe from Pennsylvania. Thank you, Joe, for the question. Uh, what you got before we jump to his question? Yeah, just if you call, you, you'll be prompted with what's your name. Like you have to give them your name and then you'll hear our voicemail. So uh, if you do call the hotline, because I called it just to kind of give Mike a hard time, <laughs> which Should I found out about th- first. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> uh, I was just about 30 minutes later, Mike, Mike called me out, but it was, it was different. So the first time I called it, it went straight to voicemail. The second time I called it, it asked for my name and then played the voicemail. So don't freak out. Don't feel like you got the wrong number, but yeah, these hotline questions, uh, Mike's he's, I mean, he ain't lying. There are a ton in there. Uh, we couldn't get to all of them, but again, it's a long off season, so get them in there. We may not get them to them this week, but they'll come a point in the off season. We do. All right, so let's kick it over to Joe from Pennsylvania, and let's uh, answer his question on the other side here, Shane. Hey, Mike, cousin Shane, this is Joe. Currently live in Pennsylvania, but I'm a graduate from University of South Carolina, Go Cox. Um, I actually have a suggestion and a. a question for you guys 
my suggestion is doing a, a podcast during the off season when things are slow, rating every SEC stadium one through 14 from best to worst environment. Uh, that's my suggestion. My question is this. What do you think the ceiling is for Shane Beamer as a, a program? Not necessarily this season, but what is his ceiling? Is it SEC East champions? Is it nine or ten win program with a good uh, New Year's Six Bowl? Uh, what is Shane Beamer's ceiling? Uh, I really appreciate your guys' podcast. Love listening to it every day. And uh, Cox by 90. All right, so a two-parter. Man, we're already getting advanced here with these uh, – the second time we're doing a question. But, hey, again, I very much appreciate it, Joe. Let's tackle the home field advantage question first, Shane. And there's a number of ways you can do this. There's there's no right answer. There's no wrong answer. Everybody's thinking that, uh, you know, their, their fans got – Wait till you put it on Twitter, Mike. There are plenty of wrong answers. <laughs> very, very subjective – rankings here but before yeah. we get into the actual ranking Shane I'll throw up this graphic on the screen if you're watching on YouTube and uh, if you're just listening bear with me here got a lot of numbers to throw at you let's look at first Shane the last 10 years in the SEC and uh, just so we don't go overboard with the uh, the numbers here let's just focus on SEC records and the yeah. reason I picked 10 years that's when Missouri and Texas A&M came into the league I feel like that gives you a, it's a nice round number. And um, some of these numbers, Shane, just, I also want to add this little caveat here. Some of these numbers are not exactly the same. And that's because Georgia and Florida, they play in Jacksonville. So their numbers are a little off. Arkansas mm -hmm. and A&M, they play in Arlington every year. And then the COVID year just screwed up everybody. So yeah, some of these are not exactly the same but uh, pretty close here and no surprise top of the list again the last 10 years at home Alabama in conference play Shane 39 and 2 how, how oh, wild is that and they're mad they're mad that they <laughs> lost it the last two years you know you've lost two games at home in the last 10 years that's crazy Mike two SEC games that that no two games total uh, I'm looking here. I know you didn't want to do total, but 66 and two, that is just freaking nuts. And and if when Nick Saban hit that campus, if you knew 10 years, or I don't even know how many years he's been down there now. What, 15? How long has he been down there? 14? I think, th I think this will be his 17th. Holy shit, man. I was way off. But I mean, think about that. Just where the, the, the tide was to where they're at right now and complaining about two lost seasons blows my mind, man. This is, this is just an unreal stat, and you don't think about it until you see it. Right. And also, Shane, because I can already hear people typing away, just because Alabama's got the best record, I'm not sitting here saying they got the, that is the best home field because they, they got the best roster. They mm -hmm. get, they, they, over the last 10 years, they had the best coach. So I understand all that's factored in. I'm just giving you the pure stats at this point in time. And second on this list, Shane, Georgia, 30 and five. Again, very respectable. I mean, they're, you're aver averaging half a home loss in SEC play for the Georgia Bulldogs. That's the second best home record in the SEC. Yeah, and, and just thinking about where the program's at now, yeah, you know that I I don't know how long that's going to be a five over there, but it could be a couple of seasons. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, Georgia Georgia is 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 just pumping out talent and 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 wins every single year. So, um, yeah, that's still that's st but again, not a crazy stat. It's a stat that you know you expect. Alabama, Georgia, they're they're always going to be toward the top here, uh, but it's it's still kind of crazy that with one hand you could count the losses in ten years at home. Right. Next on the list, Shane LSU with a thirty and eleven home record. Again, very very respectable considering they're playing in the West. They don't got any of these neutral site games. They're playing, uh, you know, Murderers Row in addition to playing Florida who at times is, you know, one of the best programs in the country, 30 and 11 at home in yeah. 10 years. Very good record for the Tigers. 
Absolutely. And, and and the fact that you've gone through what three coaches during that time, you yeah. know, I mean, uh, I mean, that's, that's one of the wildest parts is, is the fact if you looked at the coaching change, you would think that that's a struggling program yet in 10 years, they're still sitting up there. Now, a lot of that was early, early dominance, but I mean, look at them last year winning the West. Yep. And uh, next on this list, this surprised me, Shane, to see them this high. Maybe just a little recency bias just because they've struggled under their former coach. Auburn, Shane, 26 and 15 mm. at home the last 10 years. And we got to see some of that with Cadillac taking over as interim coach. You know, that place was just electric. That They basically willed them to a win against Texas A&M, if you remember, late last season. And they had some terrific seasons under Gus Malzahn, and they're hoping to get that back under Hugh Freeze. Going to the Plains, that's a dangerous place to play, my friend. Well, it's 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 like a sleeping giant, you know. Nobody, Everybody has enjoyed, other than Auburn fans, Auburn struggling, you know. Right. Because when they're down, it's like, now I can get, get my punch in. Because you know, in the next two or three years, that thing's going to wake up, and then they're going to become dominant again. So... Uh, and this, the numbers don't lie. Ten years, and they're still sitting. I mean, even though they've had a terrible last two, three seasons, they're still sitting at the top of that list when it comes to home wins against the SEC. You hear that ringing in the background? Yeah. Is that Hugh? That's the voicemail line. That's what it does every huh. time someone calls it. So we're getting <laughs> another one right now. So apologies for that. But, uh, all right, how about next on the list, Shane? Florida, again, the last ten seasons – 25 and 11 mm. at home. I mean, the swamp <laughs> is still as dangerous as ever. And that's, you know, considering some questionable years. I mean, hell, they they were great at times under Dan Mullen. And I realized last year was not up to their elite standard. But that gives you an indication, man. There's a reason yeah. opponents do not survive down there very often. You know what? Yeah, uh, trust me. I've I've been on the receiving end of some losses down there in in the swamp. So it is not a fun place to visit. It is not a fun place to watch your team if you're not a Florida fan. Uh, you know this is still similar to Auburn. Kind of impressive that they're still sitting this high on the list. But just again to show you how good that program has been. And yep. another one, a sleeping giant, just waiting for the right coach, the right, right team, right opportunity to to get back on top of that horse. Now, I think this selection would surprise a lot of people, Shane, but those that know SEC football know mm -hmm. williams Bryce Stadium, Shane, as dangerous as they come. 23-17 and 17 at home in the last 10 years in SEC play. And again, this is... There's been a lot of down years for South Carolina, yet <laughs> yeah. they're all the way up this list. That gives you an indication just uh, what a tough environment that is to play. Absolutely, Mike. And uh, one of the most crazy night game atmospheres that you could see <laughs> is in William Bryce. <laughs> Trust me, the place is freaking rocking. So, uh, no, South Carolina, it does surprise you. Again, coach change, the down seasons that they have, that, that they are this far up. But – Again, it shows you that, you know, any that's why why they're getting the hop now is because they are real SEC contenders and, and that home field record speaks for itself. And shout out Joe for the question. They're six and two at home in SEC play under Shane Beamer. So that they're significantly better in the last two years than they their ten year average. Jeez. So that's only gonna get better and better. You know what? You're right. Absolutely. Now next on this list, this one surprised us, Shane. Missouri up mm -hmm. there. People love to make fun of the rocks and all that. 23 The rock and garden, baby. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, that, hey, them rocks are working for them, Shane, because they got a 23 and 19 yeah. home record the last 10 years playing some of the best teams in the country coming up there. Missouri in the top half of the SEC home field advantage records here. How, how big of a surprise is that to you? It's, it is a big surprise, Mike. And, and, you know, the more I think about it, it's like I would like to know how many of those games they were underdogs, you know. <laughs> I, I think of that LSU match or Dan Mullen a few years ago. It was just 
there it's a sneaky place georgia almost experienced it you know what i'm saying it's it's like a it's a little trap trap game you know and and you get Mm -hmm. up there and you you don't think about how loud that environment can be but man they got a hell of a home field advantage so yeah kudos to mizzou here and no surprise next on the list shane we we credit this place all the time it's one of the most underrated gems in all of college football starkville mississippi mississippi state 22 and 19 over the last 10 years again they they're playing in the west they rarely have a talent advantage in those matchups when they're in the nation's toughest division over that 10 year span arguably still the nation's toughest division yet they have a home field advantage every saturday they play down there with a 22 and 19 record over the last 10 years uh those fans are are just tremendous you know what absolutely dangerous place to play it does get loud it does get crazy and you know I'm, I'm i'm ready for them to 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 get that environment back you know it felt like we were on the on the brink of it here last year year before last and and it's just maybe maybe this is the season when when this kicks back up because i could see mississippi state moving up this list brother Mm-hmm. And next on the list, Shane, this one surprised me too. Oh, actually, these next two being ahead of some of the teams, they are Kentucky and Ole Miss. Mm. They both have losing records, so you, you know you'd like to see that turned around. Twenty and twenty-one in, over a ten-year span in the SEC. But let's give credit, Shane, to Lane Kiffin since he's been there at Ole Miss, turning things around, moving past the COVID season. He is six and two in his last eight yeah. SEC home games. It, Kiffin catches a lot of hell for not winning <laughs> enough games. Well, he's winning at home six and two the last two years in conference play. Credit Kentucky and Ole Miss for being higher on this list than than some of the teams we've yet to even discuss. Yeah, I mean you're, you're talking an Ole Miss team that was top five just last year, and and a Kentucky team that. Yeah, I, I think the the second half of that that decade is is going to move them up this list and going to continue. So it's like you got to get some of those bad numbers off first. You know, that's that's kind of where Kentucky's at. And if they keep doing what they're doing, they're going to move up this list, no doubt. Uh, I think one of the surprising stats as I'm looking here, Mike, o- Ole Miss forty five and twenty two at home, twenty and twenty one against SEC, meaning they've only got one loss against a non-SEC team in the last 10 years at home. That's that's impressive. Yeah, well, that's what happens when you schedule cupcakes, Shane. Ah, no, uh, don't just... do that. <laughs> Jeez, look, I just bring them back up. Mike wants to shoot them down. Why do you hate Ole Miss? Is it because we've got Mississippi State on today? <laughs> well, remember, uh, you know, I mean, just look at their schedule. That's where they're nah, going to kind of mock and how, how – I easy know, that was, but uh, Jeez, how about Louise. next on the list, Shane? This surprised me that it was this low. Texas A&M, yeah. 19 and 17 in the last decade in the SEC. But Shane, I think that's misleading because if you look at we, I also got the five years. I'll, I'll, I can throw this up as well. The last five years, Shane. So basically, the Jimbo Fisher era. They're 13 and five under Jimbo Fisher in College yeah. Station. So they have turn that place into one hell of a home field advantage. So, yeah, th- these numbers are not pretty for the 10-year, but really all that matters is, you know, where you're at now with your current coach and all that. Mm-hmm. And, man, the 12th man, that place is a rocket. Remember, what? It, who was it, Dan Mullen? Remember? <laughs> we got to lift these COVID restrictions because he went to College Station yeah. and they, they couldn't handle the crowd and it ruined their perfect season. You know what? Absolutely. We joked about them sneaking in some people there in the back door, you know, because that, that place did look a little more crowded than most stadiums Saturday. But, no, I, I'm with you here. A&M, obviously a rough start uh, when they joined the SEC, uh, but it's a program that is on the rise. For, for, throw last year out. Obviously, that was a one-off. Yeah. But moving forward, I think I think a and going to be moving up this list probably quicker than anybody. Now, Shane, I mean, you, you've got – I know cried or anything yet all I cr- the way down this list it's a long decade you know decade of dysfunction it was like 
two years, you know, or two decades. So I, you don't realize just how shitty your team is until you're looking at a list like this. And you're like, golly, man, we, we did it. We made it. You know, we made it through those hard times. Yep. So Tennessee finally makes their debut on this rankings. 19 and 22 mm. at home in conference play the last 10 years. But, Shane, I can already hear the butts in the mentions. Six and two at home in conference play under Josh Heupel. So clearly yeah. that is turning around. Uh, obviously, no, you just have to point to that Alabama game last year. There, there was not a better scene in all of college football. So the Neyland fans, are they're incredible. They're elite. The team and the coaching has let them down far more uh, over the last decade than anything. The fans keep showing up. And as long as they keep showing up for Josh Heupel, and why, the, why wouldn't they? Uh, Tennessee – they're not nearly as bad as this record indicates. You know what? No, nah, we're back. We're back, baby. And 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 I think that's what makes it so sweet is seeing, you know, when I see those 22 losses, I watched every one of them, you know, to the very <laughs> end. It, it wasn't like, oh, I'll just turn this thing off and it didn't happen, you know. I yep. lived all 22 losses in the last 10 years. It's been a long, long journey, man, and it, it just <laughs> feels good. That's I think that's why we're so – I uh, Tennessee gets a bad rap online, you know, just because they're so, I mean, we're kind of assholes. I get that, but <laughs> you know, look at the record, man. Look where we've been. We were in the dark alley getting our ass kicked every single Saturday. Yep. And finally we could take a victory lap. So yeah, we're going to do it. And we're going to do it loud <laughs> and proud. So, uh, no, I, this is, this is kind of eye opening. I didn't think we'd be this far down the list, but man, it has been a rough, rough 10 years for sure. Right. Well, it's also been a rough couple of years at Arkansas, Shane. They're next yeah. on the Arkansas yep. 11 and 25 in the last 10 years in conference play. So, ain't pretty, but uh, no. you know, they have significantly turned that around under Sam Pittman. Let's see the last 2 years, 3 and 3. So, at least 500 in conference play the last couple of years, but uh, they have got to turn that more into home field advantage like we saw against Texas. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. Texas could not handle that. When those fans want to show up, Arkansas Razorback Stadium, it's up there. You know what? You know, I always think uh, when I when I am seeing Arkansas here, Tennessee and Arkansas. There is a meme I made once, and it was these two guys sitting at a bar, and a Tennessee guy was holding the chair out, well welcoming the Arkansas. This is during Chad Morris days, you know. <laughs> and it's like, you know, first time here, you know, kind of <laughs> kind of scenario, and it's like, man, we. We've had our ups and we've definitely had our downs. And, uh, but this again, it's encouraging to see two programs like this that are hovering closer to the top than the bottom now. And, and that all starts with home field advantage. It all starts with being loud, uh, you know, on Saturdays and Saturday nights. So, um, I, I, I'm not discouraged that either one of these guys are on there because I'm encouraged by what they've, the product they've been putting out here the last few seasons. Mm -hmm. So obviously the last team on the list, Vanderbilt, ten yeah. and thirty-one over the last decade at home, and uh, just you know unfortunate for that for the ta those players and the coaching staff. But I mean, it is what it is, and far too often their home game is an away game, and it's it's just a damn shame. Uh, but <laughs> hey, I I don't know. I guess you got to give fans something to to cheer about and I think Clark Lee has done that but we've got to we got to have a better showing than we've had in recent years you know what god Lee, I'm just looking at that Arkansas and Vanderbilt both average less than one s no is that right would you say one year one win yeah I guess you say one SEC win a year is the average for the last man that's that is brutal that is brutal and Vanderbilt down there are not I'm not we better pause this, Mike. I don't want Arkansas swerving into traffic here, you know. So, but I'm just saying, better days are ahead for, for both programs. Vanderbilt too, man. Vanderbilt, yeah. I you know got two wins, uh, two SEC wins last year, and uh, I, I'm not saying that they're going to kill it with home field advantage, but you know, I think with what Coach Lee's building, I think there's an opportunity for them to make an improvement and again be a team that nobody you know, can count out or just guaranteed win on Saturday. Right. So having said that, we threw out the record, Shane. This is how I see it as a home field advantage, in my opinion. And, I, again, 
No one's going to agree with me. Even Shane's probably going to rip into me here. Yeah. <laughs> but let's start at the bottom. Obviously, got to go Vanderbilt, right? Number 14. Yeah, and I want to ask you on this before we get too far into it. Are we talking current climate or, or are you factoring I'm, I'm in talking, 10 years? I mean, a, a little bit because that's kind of why I wanted to throw that out there to just, I yeah. mean, records are what they are. But again, there's, there's many factors here. So I'm yeah. basically saying who's got the best home field right now as of today these are my okay. rankings yeah and i think that's good and, and and again before we get on this list this is not you know fanfare this is not experience outside the stadium you know who's got the best college entrance none of that this is just hey it, it's kickoff time which which fan base is the least fun to be around on saturdays <laughs> yeah okay so 14 vanderbilt yeah 13 I think it's Ole Miss, Shane. And, yeah. again, they've they've had a hell of a record under Lane Kiffin, particularly the last two years, at home. So maybe I'm wrong about this, but when I think of Ole Miss, I just don't think of a, a, a truly – I mean, it's an elite party scene. Don't get me wrong. You but, think of the Grove. I mean, that's the only right. thing I think of is just walking around saying hotty toddy all the time, you know. Right, right. So that's kind of why I got them so low on this list. Well, I mean, even you had Lane Kiffin – come out last season and, and yeah. talk about the fans. I mean, right. your head coach is, is begging you to fill that stadium out because that helps recruiting. So yeah, that's, that's not going to, that's not going to move you up on this list. All right. I'm going to lose some fans here, Shane, but I, <laughs> I'm trying to be as honest as I can. And, I, and we just stated the records here. I'm going to Arkansas 12. Is that fair? Hmm. Oh man, you know, Mike. I, I think know, we gotta a, put a someone little, there. You know, I know you got. <laughs> <laughs> There's like a handful I'm looking at, and I guess current climate. I, I guess a little bit more current than oh, shit, Mike. You look at the last ten years. I'm, I'm. Do you are you scared to death to go to Arkansas and play college football? No, I, I don't think so. When you're looking at eleven wins the last ten years, so. Mm -hmm. Oh man, that's crazy to be that low, but yeah, I can I can be convinced. Right. And next on my list, Shane, underrated. Again, I hate to put them even this low. They've had some big wins at home in recent they've turned this into a, the, years ago, Shane, this would be 13 or 14, but they've moved up my list. Kentucky, number 11. Thoughts yeah. on that? I mean, remember, I mean, who was it? Cash yeah. Daniels. He was he was having to sell tickets in the Walmart parking lot, remember? <laughs> This is definitely, uh, obviously not 10 years of work here. This is what they've been able to do the last four or five seasons. Um, that they, they are, they're selling out the stadium for once, you know, they, you know, this yep. stadium wasn't always packed and, and, uh, it is a loud environment and I've seen some, some games influenced by, by the, the, you know, it's, you don't think about that in places like Kentucky and Mizzou, you know, but they yeah. can get a little bit violent down there and, and, and disruptive. So, uh, man, I still, I can't get over this is where I'm at. Cause I'm like, but is it worse than Arkansas? Because this, you know, you got to, <laughs> well, let me ask you on the Arkansas thing. If uh -oh. you threw out, you know, bouncing around different stadiums, maybe some more night games, which they've not been getting a lot of love lately. Mm -hmm. Um, Jerry's world. I mean, could you see it move up the list in that? Is that a factor that you have them? I, I hate to go back to Arkansas, but I'm just now you're you're comparing them to Kentucky. And, well, I think I'm that's why they want you. A and M back home because they want that advantage because it because it is yeah. an advantage and they're not and hell their 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 luck's been god awful in Jerry world. I think that may be the key reason, but uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, they certainly are moving up the list, but I got to put yeah, someone down there. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, you're right. All right, I'm with you, man. And Kentucky's <laughs> improving too, so uh, I really like I, – I love the night game atmosphere that they have there. Mm -hmm. All right, 10 on my list, Shane. Missouri Tigers. And, again, mm -hmm. maybe this is too low because if you look at where they've ranked, they're, they're in right in the – they're in the upper tier if you want to just cut the, the SEC in half over a 10-year average. Uh, I do think it's a great home field advantage. they got some great fans, but um, – I don't know. I, 10 feels about right. Just cause I'm just, all I'm doing is looking at some of the environments ahead of them. And I'm like, Oh my, yeah. all these are elite. You know what? 
Yeah, yeah. I I would say I would move Mizzou up if they were allowed to bring cowbells to their facility. But <laughs> until then, I, I think you're I think you're going to have to leave them right here. But again, it is one of those games uh, that's tricky. It is a uh, it's it's you know one of the things too is just weather. Uh, you know you don't factor that in with with some of these stadiums, but Mizzou weather is so up and down and all over the place. I mean, you you'll start the season and. And, and you may have, you know, 100 degrees and then you end the season in snow. So it's it's just one of the wilder <laughs> environments. And, and that's one, one of the factors I would make it a, a little bit tougher place to play. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I'm with you here with Mizzou. All right, how about uh, number nine? I think you teased it already with the Cowbells. Yeah. Mississippi State, number nine. They they deserve to be in the top ten, don't you think? Yeah, and, and, and a lot of that has to – do with the cowbells man and and just the fanfare that goes along with that in my opinion um it's it's not particularly a scary place to play but man it's annoying if you're not a fan you know it is <laughs> it is a long game especially if you're losing so uh yeah i would i would have them there and and a lot that had to do with the cowbell all right how about uh, number eight on the list shane i've got williams bryce stadium south Ooh. carolina an elite place to play football. Mm, Mike, this is the first one I'm really going to have to disagree with you. Mm. Uh, I think I think William Bryce is is a madhouse, and I don't I don't know if they're filled with all college kids or what, but it is absolutely nuts <laughs> at times there. Uh, when they got the sandstorm going, a night game. I, I remember watching a video of them. Uh, some sort of drone or something like that. Couldn't hear the stand. Then all of a sudden you get over and just, just like you, the impact of the noise, it's crazy. And when that place gets going and gets hopping, and that's the thing, they got a lot of buzz right now. So you talk about moving up the list. They're doing that each and every season here. The, the last few years, Beamer's been there. So, um, yeah, I'm a little higher on uh, Columbia here. Okay, maybe you can talk me into it. Let's see. See which one of these you switch out with it. Next on my list, I got Auburn on the yeah. plains in an elite place, despite, uh, you know, Brian Harson trying to do his best to <laughs> railroad us here. Still, in my mind, uh, in an elite place to play college football. S- number seven, Auburn. What's your thoughts there? Yeah, I definitely had them, uh, you know, further down than uh, South Carolina. But the, the thing with Auburn is you got a glimpse of it. You know, they're at the end of the season. We got to see our boy coach, and 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 it got it got wild, it got loud, and 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 it's a reminder just how crazy. I mean, you think of some of the craziest games you ever watched was in Jordan Hare Stadium, you know, and and it could ha- easily happen again. It's just they need some good seasons under their belt, and and so I'm not saying that Auburn can't move up this list, Mike, but I can definitely see why you got them where they're at. All right, how about number six? Tennessee, Neyland Stadium. Thoughts on that one? God, Lee, Mike, they're number one, man. Have you <laughs> have you been to Neyland? <laughs> uh, you know, and this is considering. I mean, hell, they shit, were Mike, they're twelfth. They're twelfth in the last yeah. decade. But again, they're what is it four? Yeah, fourth in the last two years. So they're, that's a I tough know. one to gauge. It is tough. It is tough, and and it's just because I've been to some of the loudest games in that stadium that has ever had, and I have definitely seen the impact that you know a hundred thousand fans there in England can have. Uh, the atmosphere and everything, man. I, I am so biased, man. I could just I know I'm oozing orange here, but I got to have my balls a little higher than this, just because. You're thinking about the last few seasons. You know how many right. SEC losses did they have in England last year? Zero. Exactly. So a lot of that had to do with home field. I think of the Florida game in particular. I think of the Alabama game. I mean, that was a violent place. Uh, the Ole Miss game we went to a few years ago, obviously we didn't throw anything on the field, but I could see why they were, man, because it was crazy, <laughs> man. It was a, it was just an electric atmosphere, and and uh, the fans almost won that game until they lost it, you know, so – uh, I've got well, Tennessee higher, man. I know. Let me, let me ask you the ultimate question then, because we can't move everybody up here. Yeah. South Carolina or Tennessee? Who's higher? Hmm. You got to pick one. Well, Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> 
Tennessee. Okay. Tennessee, but I, maybe I'd have Auburn a little bit lower just right now. Just, you okay. know, I don't know. Maybe. What, what, what do you got now? Right, now I, got I got me. number five, Texas A&M. I, well, see, big, I would have. I, they're I, elite. I, I know, I know, but you're you're everybody twelfth man. I mean, I could put that on my stadium. You know, I could put that in South Carolina Stadium. I could twelfth man hasn't been the twelfth man in a while, brother. I yeah. mean, it hasn't since the 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 Alabama win. You know, I I can't name a game. Well, I guess that's not fair because there has been some good games, but and, and the fans L- show they beat up. LSU I, in their last one. I know. Yeah, I was trying to think. I don't know. I, I it's just. I don't know. You're right, brother. That is a crazy place to play. That is a very uh, – the thing about it is it's just – it's typically packed, you know. The, like, there's right. there's no empty seats. And, and if an SEC team's in there, pretty much it's going to be sold out. Um, that, that makes it tough to play. But, man, I don't know. I'd have them just maybe a smidge. I'd have them under Tennessee and South Carolina. I would, okay. I would right now. I trust you. I trust you. All right, number four on my list, Shane, the Swamp, Florida. <laughs> the swamp is a terrible place to play. I mean, it is <laughs> terrible. It is, it is the nineties. It was unbearable. You know yep. what I'm saying? You did not want to go to, I knew people that would go to that game wearing their game jerseys with a Florida Jersey over top or a neutral shirt <laughs> over top, get to their spot, take their shirt off, put it back on to walk back to their vehicles, you know, because not only was just the environment crazy, but the fans were violent. The fans were loud. Florida Gators, uh, the swamp itself, uh, definitely a tough place to play. But this is a team, Mike, right now you've got too high on your list just because of mm-hmm. where they're at. You know, they're the, – the last game I thought of – I mean, seriously. Remember I did, Utah. I, I mean, man, Utah looks shook. I know. I, yeah. Well, I mean, you could pinpoint one or two games for each one of them <laughs> or the home field. You know, I'm just thinking – as as a as a overall, Florida is one of those that I told you earlier is a sleeping giant that could definitely be a number one or two on this list. It's just going into this season, I wouldn't have them as high as Texas A and M, Tennessee, or South Carolina right now. Oh, okay, you're moving them that far down, huh? Yeah. All right. How about number three, LSU? Yeah, LSU should be one. I'm I'm not going to lie to you. One? Huh? I, I mean. Yeah, well, I mean, they should be at some point. Uh, right. You know, I think when – if Kelly starts producing 11, went 12-game seasons, you know, wins, I, I think they're going to be a clear-cut number one because that is one of the most violent places to play. It is – is la- I mean, they, it's Death Valley, man. At night, I mean, it's its own vibe, and you can't you – can't, you can't mimic it, brother. And I, I just think that when they – and, and – we should – all SEC teams should be worried. You know, you, you talk about Saban yesterday and you talked about, uh, you know, Kirby just repeating championships and stuff. But that little LSU helmet sitting right beside you, if that team starts putting their shit together, that will be one of the most electric environments yet again. It will be number one. So mm. I have no quarrel with you having it at this spot here. But, um, but yeah, you're talking about home field advantage, Death Valley, jeez. Now, for me, Shane, two and one, I mean, this was the tightest, toughest decision on the entire board. Alabama's got the best record. So you can easily, easily make the case for that. But I'm going with them dogs, Shane. I mean, Tennessee's (laughs) found out. Arkansas's found out. Damn, everybody that steps into that stadium has found out under Kirby's – well, except for his first – his first year, Shane, he was losing – he lost to Tennessee at home. He lost to Vanderbilt at home. He, he was losing yeah. everybody on his first year. But ever since then, uh, nobody walks out of that damn stadium alive aside from uh, South Carolina, actually, believe it or not. That's the last team to beat Georgia. They are 16-1 uh, and one in their last 17 SEC home games. Give me Georgia number one. And everybody thinks I just hate Alabama now. Number yeah. two in the in the SEC is uh, you're basically saying number two in the country in my mind. So Alabama, you're number two in my book. But again, you could easily talk me into Alabama being number one. Uh, this I'm splitting hairs right here. Yeah, and this is this is a tough part of the list right here. This is where you're going to get most of your complaints because. 
People are going to say Alabama didn't win because of home field advantage. Georgia's not winning because of home field advantage. They're winning because they're loaded with NFL rosters, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, I could see that argument. L- like, LSU skews games because of the noise and environment. I would easily put – I would rather have them at one. I would move personally Georgia and Alabama down – not because it's not a crazy place to play or that you're probably going to lose, but it's just – Well, it's Shane, almost, we could, I mean, I could spin it this way too. I mean, we've seen Tennessee play at Georgia. They got outclassed. Yeah. They, they played out – last time they played at Alabama. I mean, they kept it close for a little while. But they played LSU last year. They smoked them in Death Valley. Well, no, and again, I, I think – you, if I'm picking one between Georgia and Alabama because of that Tennessee matchup, I would put Georgia mm-hmm. ahead of Alabama just because when called upon, you know, the shoulder pads came out, the dogs came barking, that place <laughs> got loud and violent. It is it is an extreme – but every, almost every SEC cathedral is yeah. that way. You know what I'm saying? So – I'm just thinking if I'm leaning one or the other, I'm going to have probably Georgia one, Alabama two, and that's that. That's no knock on Alabama and their their stadium. I mean, clearly we're we're talking two losses in the last ten years. And what was that losses? There was Alabama, uh, LSU. That was a close game. That came yep. down on the wire. Twenty nineteen. What was the other one? Uh, Ole Miss. Hugh one? Freeze. No. Got oh it. yeah, that was a miracle. So, I mean, you think about that. It, it took some really, I mean, even the two, it wasn't like they, they got beat. They just, they lost, they made mistakes. So, Oh, Mike, Mike, this is, this is where you're going to get them because a lot of people aren't going to see it the way you're, you're, you're saying it. They're not going to, they're not going to take a pause and look at the 10 year record and say, okay, Mike, this makes sense. They're going to say, are you kidding me? This is a, have you been to Neyland? Have you, have you been to Columbia? Have you, been? those atmospheres are different though. They're different. And, um, but it, the numbers don't lie either. So I, I see where you're trying to balance yeah. and factor, but. Give me, uh, give me Georgia number one myself. Uh, just if it weren't for that Tennessee game, I'd have them further down the list. Uh, Alabama and then uh, LSU there. Well, Shane, I thought we would get through that a lot quicker, but my God, we, we could probably spiel all night about home field oh. advantages and change our minds and and talk ourselves into this and that and this and that. But remember, he's got a second part, so maybe we won't spend near as much time on this part, but. What is the ceiling he wants to know for Shane Beamer's South Carolina program? It it doesn't. He's not talking about this year. What's the record going to be or anything like that? Because he said, you know, can they win the East? Can they win the SEC? Um, and I'll I'll tell you. Here's something that sticks with me, Shane. When we're talking South Carolina, listen to some of these streaks. And I'm not trying to downgrade them, but I we got to put this into perspective when we're talking about how far South Carolina's come under Shane Beamer and what they can accomplish. They've lost seven out of nine to Kentucky. They've lost eight out of nine to Texas A&M. They've lost seven out of eight to Clemson. They've lost three out of four to Tennessee. Now, I, I put those in order because they beat all those teams last year. Shane Beamer is a big reason why they snapped all those streaks. But we've got to... We've got to have some consistency there before we're looking at winning the SEC, before we're challenging what looks like the greatest budding dynasty in college football in Georgia. They've lost four to five to Florida. They have not beaten Eli Drinkwitz. They've lost four in a row to Missouri. So there are challenges to come. But to answer the a lot question, of numbers you're throwing at me, Mike. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, a lot of losses, but again, that's yeah. not all on Shane Beamer. Certainly, I, I can already hear them getting mad that I'm even throwing these out there. But they are recruiting like crazy, Shane. Number three recruiting class in the SEC, number six class in the country. So the arrow is pointed way up, and yeah. I think the ceiling for South Carolina and this, Shane. There's two things. For programs like South Carolina, I've seen both arguments, but here's my side of it, and I'm sticking to it. Expanded playoff, SEC expanding, that is going to rise all these programs in the SEC. I I think in the current four-team format, Shane, I think the ceiling for South Carolina is, you know, it would take a miracle but to win the SEC. That's as good as you're going to get. 
in a 12-team playoff, Shane, there's no reason Shane Beamer can't take South Carolina to not just one, but multiple playoff appearances, you know, depending on how long he's there. I I anticipate he'll be there for a while. But the way they're recruiting, they need to be in that mix for the college football playoff. I think Mm -hmm. that that is a realistic goal, not next year with the four team, but maybe in the year after when we expand to 12. I think that is a realistic goal. And that's not to say if they don't make the playoff, Nick, in two years, we got fire everybody. I'm, I'm not crazy, yeah. but I'm saying that is, uh, I think, realistic given uh, what the success we've seen at South Carolina under Steve Spurrier. There's no reason they're not going to have three 11 win seasons in a row, I don't think, in a tougher SEC. But I think he can string together a couple 10 win seasons. I think he can be in college football playoff contention at South Carolina. What's your thoughts? Well, I think momentum is 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 key with with Beamer and South Carolina. I think about this um, this eighteen wheeler I got behind this morning. We're we're moving along fifty five miles an hour, and it's going great. You know, I'm not even thinking about passing them or anything. I'm not too far from my house, but then we come up on a couple of mowers, you know, these tractors that are mowing and stuff, and so we we come to a crawl. Well, it took forever for it to get back up. By the time it got fifty five, I'm already turned off the highway you know so <laughs> i i'm just what i'm saying is a, a long way of saying it is right now they have momentum and they've got the buzz they got the, you know it's a fun place to play there you could see that with the recruiting um but it's not a program that has built that is going to be built on on just recruiting it by itself it's got to be a it, that's what they got to do they got they want to be part of the next best thing mm-hmm. and they cannot afford to have a bad season they really can't mike this is a pivotal year for them if they fall off this year it it, it will be it will be terrible for everything that Shane's trying to build over there in Columbia, in my opinion. So and I'm thinking best case scenario, because you got to, you got to remember, it's not going to be East and West anymore, Mike. It, it's it's going to be, what, what are you in the SEC? I think that the ceiling could be a, you know, a two, three best team in the SEC, maybe, maybe make it to a, an SEC championship. You know, I could definitely see that, but it's harder. Yeah, it's not bringing this up because it's South Carolina, but Spurrier even said it's harder to win the SEC than it is the college football playoffs. And I find it easier for Beamer and company to get to a college football playoff. So the ceiling for me for South Carolina is just what you said, a couple appearances into the college football playoffs, being one of the top 12 teams in the country. I could definitely see this program doing that. But they cannot afford to slow down for mowers, Mike, you know, because if they do, <laughs> if they do, then this will not because to say that they can just win an SEC title like that's the ceiling. Do you know how many SEC championships they have, Mike? Zero. <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> what what makes you think that Beamer's all of a sudden going to get it while he's there? So I think it's easier. It's going to be easier for this program to be top 12 in the country than it is to actually win the SEC championship. So your ceiling, making it to the playoffs. Well, the good news, Shane, in the new SEC, you could be the third best team in the SEC. That probably pegs you as the fifth team in the college football <laughs> yeah. playoff. You know what? <laughs> How many happy Gamecock fans will there be? You know what I'm saying? So this that is a ceiling, and that is a obtainable goal. You know, and I think that's that's what's crazy. It's, we're not talking the stars align and it's just everything works perfectly. We're talking, hey, a couple of good years, you could be there. You know, I, I think what helps is just again keep that momentum up. Build a team after Rattler because he's not going to be around here forever, you know, and and don't have a drop-off. Just keep going. Keep that momentum going at South Carolina. It will always be a scary program. Yep. All right, Shane, so let's kick it over now to our interview. We're about to go Joe Rogan length here to our interview, (laughs) Stefan Krajiznik from the Clarion Leisure. All right, we're pleased to be joined once again by Stefan Krajiznik. Did I get it right finally? You've been on like five times. It's close. It's close. (laughs) David. Okay, next time. I swear I'll have it. But Steph, he covers Mississippi State, of course, for the Clarion Ledger, the biggest paper in the state of Mississippi. Uh, Steph, thank you so much for joining me once again. I really appreciate having you back on the show. Thanks for having me on. Like we were just talking about, I mean, it's 
seems like media days and the football season will be here before we know it. Yeah. And, you know, I think one thing, obviously you, you're well aware of this, you've chronicled every step of this, but uh, I think a lot of SEC fans maybe are not oh, totally aware of um, all the tragedy that occurred with this uh, this university, this football program, even going back to a former assistant uh, that, that left for, for USC, Dave Nickel, have been with Mike Leach for a long, long time. But multiple uh, people died. And I, I hate to start on, on, a, on a down note here, but is there any sense that, um, and heck, they still even had a good year for, for Mississippi State, won nine football games. Is 2023, do you get any sense that, uh, you know, we're turning the page and, and it'll be some momentum behind, uh, you know, hopefully, let's let's hope hope and pray there's there's no tragedies that, you know, uh, that we can spring forward and, and thankfully put some of this these tragedies behind us. Yeah, I think when you look at it, you know, from a national perspective, there's still, you know, a lot of question marks around this team. I think, you know, people are unsure kind of what, you know, the Zach Barnett era is going to look like, what Kevin Barbe is going to look like as an offensive coordinator. There's there's some doubt nationally, which isn't really, you know, uh, an, an unusual situation for Mississippi State. I think nationally they're usually, you know, projected to be around those six, seven win range, if not, you know, fewer than that. Um, but I think when, when you look internally at, at this team and kind of the, the roster that they've got, the coaching staff that they've assembled, the coaches that have returned, particularly, um, you know, on the defensive side from last season is, you know, they're looking at everything they overcame, overcame last season to go on and win nine games, to have most of that roster returning. I, I think when you ask the players and, and we got to talk to Will Rogers, you know, after the spring game this past Saturday, and you definitely got that sense from him that, you know, he's fine with whatever the expectations may be externally, because I think internally, there's a lot of belief that Mississippi State could win those nine games again and, and kind of get back to to that level and, and be a team that's ranked for most of the year and, and competes, you know, in some big games, win some big games. So I think, you know, there, there's so many question marks surrounding what this team's going to look like with, you know, specifically with this new offense. But when, when you look at the roster and when you look at what they have coming back and you kind of look at the schedule that they have and the opportunities that are there, I think there's no doubt that, you know, at least here in Starkville, there's some pretty high expectations, which is kind of tough for a first year head coach, right? I mean, you're, you're a first time in the SEC. It's your first time head coach, you know, anywhere, let alone being in the SEC. You got these expectations of, of what, you know, fans here w- want to see. Um, it, it creates a kind of weird dynamic of, of this national versus local perspective of what's going to happen. Um, but on paper, when you look at this roster, uh, I'm kind of surprised the expectations aren't a bit higher, you know, from a national perspective. Well, I, I'm glad that you mentioned Will Rogers because I had to ask you about him and his fit in this offensive system. Uh, how's that going so far based on what you've seen, based on what you've heard? And uh, do you find it strange that I know state fans are obviously very high on Will Rogers, but whenever there's discussion on who's the best quarterback in the SEC, outside of state fans, I don't even hear Will Rogers mentioned, even though yeah. he is, uh, you know, the uh, arguably the most experienced quarterback in the SEC, if not the country. Yeah, it's it's definitely interesting. Like, like you said there, his name doesn't get brought up a ton. I think a lot of that has to do with, you know, the numbers that he put up in the air raid and people, you know, labeling him a system quarterback, you know, albeit whether you think that's true or not, that's that's what the label was on him, right? People were saying that the reason he put up big numbers was because he was in the air raid. And yeah, some of that is a result of, you know, throwing 50, 60 passes in a game, you're going to have some impressive numbers, right? Um, but, it, you know, I kind of look at it in, in this perspective of I think Will is a better fit in this new offense. I think in the air raid, if Will was having a bad day, Mississippi State was going to lose. You look at that game last year at Kentucky, it was not Will's best game. They didn't have a chance in that game. They couldn't get anything going offensively. I think now when you look at this and you're saying, hey, you know, we think Will's a, a good quarterback, maybe not, you know, an elite quarterback that's going to be a first-round NFL pick, but he's a guy that you can trust to to not make mistakes. Like you said, he's experienced. He knows you know, when to make certain decisions and when not to do, you know, not to take certain chances. And you kind of take this offense, you say, all right, how about instead of putting the pressure on Will, we make sure that Will just, you know, gets the ball to Tula Griffin. Have him come around on a, on a reverse or a jet sweep or something like that and just get the ball to your playmakers. Don't make Will have to be the playmaker. Make, make you know, make the opportunities there for, you know, Xavion Thomas, Tulu Griffin, you know, Justin Robinson, some of these receivers. Get the running backs involved, too. We've seen you know, these running backs succeed. And even in the area, when they had their chances, they were really successful when they decided to run the ball. Um, so I think the chances are there for Will to have, you know, a really good season and kind of fit into this system almost better than he did in the area, just because you're taking a guy that's not necessarily the most talented in terms of, you know, arm talent and things of that nature. 
And, and you're putting them in a spot where you're saying, hey, how about, how about these guys who, you know, are faster, who are playmakers? Let's put the ball in their hands and let Will, you know, take chances when needed. Well, it's like you're looking right here at my notes because I, I wanted to ask you, to Lou Griffin and Xavier Thomas both made plays in the spring game, flashed their immense talent. Uh, will this be an offensive system, do you think, that uh, does a better job of showcasing their skill set? Because for whatever reason, I, I, and I know Xavier Thomas is only his second year, but uh, they've not made a, a big impact, at least just on offense. I know, I know special teams may be a different story, but how do you see them being utilized in this offense? Yeah, like you said, Xavier's a guy that I think at this point everyone's kind of like, hey, let him develop, see, see what he becomes, just because you know the the physical talent is there. And, and like you said, I mean, he had that punt return right before halftime in that game against Georgia. I mean, you you see what he can do when he has the ball in his hands. And I think that kind of goes right along with, you know, what what you do with Tulu Griffin is, you know, Tulu was an outside receiver in the air raid. He, he just didn't seem to really fit there, right? He's not a guy where you say, hey, throw it up you know, on the outside to him, let him go up and get it. He's a guy that, you know, fits better in the slot, has always fit better in the slot, in my opinion. And, you know, now with Kevin Barbe, that's where he's playing. Can come around, like you said, like we were talking about earlier, screen passes, you know, handoffs, direct handoffs to Tula Griffin. Um, and then in the spring game, we saw him catch a 20-yard pass. I mean, you're 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 just looking at a guy that physically is, is better than a lot of people in the SEC. I mean, he's right up there, you know, in terms of speed and strength. You know, with some of these elite receivers. Now, does that mean he's going to, you know, translate to a great NFL receiver? Probably not necessarily. He could. Um, but when you look at, you know, the SEC perspective of it, get the ball in his hands and he's going to make things happen just because he's got the skill set to do it. And, and I think he was just being utilized the wrong way in the air raid. And, and that's not a knock on the air raid. I just think specifically when it comes to Tula's situation, they didn't use him, you know, the right way. And I think he's a better fit in this offense. And I think, uh, it it kind of goes back to what we were talking about with Will Rogers earlier. Is is when Kevin Barber came in, he said what his offense is. You know, people right away, what? How do you define your offense? What's your offense? You know, we knew what everyone knew what the air raid was. What's what's the Kevin Barbe offense? And he said the Kevin Barbe offense is having the best eleven players on the field and making sure the ball is in, in the best players' hands. And a lot of the time, that's going to be Tulu Griffin, which is going to make it easier on Will Rogers. I, I think you don't want to jump the gun based on what you've just seen in, in spring practices, right, or what you've seen in a spring game. But that does translate a lot of the time, and, and I look at this 2023 season, and and, and I'd be stunned if, if Tulu Griffin wasn't putting up uh, much better numbers than he's put up you know, the past couple of years at State. How surprised were you when they added Mike Wright, who you know had his moments at, at Vanderbilt? They would not have beaten Florida or Kentucky without Mike Wright last season, but uh, any time a quarterback with starting experience transfers to another SEC school where they've got an established quarterback – that was interesting, and obviously his skill set so different from Will Rogers. Uh, did that surprise you? And is there any way they they don't play Mike Wright? And I'm not suggesting they're they're going to bench Will Rogers for him, but it seems like his skill set. We've got to get him on the field in some capacity. Yeah, I think to, to answer the second question there, I think he's he's going to be used in some special packages. They're going to find ways to get him involved in the offense. I wouldn't be surprised if. You know, there were some trick plays or just designed runs for him. Or the, He's too talented with the ball in his hands. Like, kind of goes back to the, the Tula Griffin conversation. He's too talented with the ball in his hands to not, you know, have some playing time, especially with that experience. You kind of trust that, hey, not only can you run, you know, some special package, but that's a guy that's going to come in and probably not make a mistake. You know, there, I mean, how many times do you see some kind of trick players, some special design, you're just like, well, was that guy thinking? Well, he's never been put in that spot before, right? You're running a trick play that, you know, for the first time in his career, he's running. You can kind of run that at state now with a guy who has a lot of SEC experience, like you said, has made some big plays, you know, in some big play, uh, in some big games at Vanderbilt. Um, to go back to your first question, I was really surprised, right? I mean, you're looking at you know, Mike Wright when he enters the portal. You're saying, all right, well, you know, he could probably go down to maybe a smaller school and, and a smaller conference, and you know, have some, you know, have a starting spot waiting for him. Maybe he goes to a bigger school and kind of compete for for a starting spot. I didn't. I didn't necessarily. I still don't think that you know it's he's going to take Will Rogers' starting job. I, I just don't you know see a world in which that happens. So that's why it was surprising of why did he come to Mississippi State then? I guess you kind of look at maybe his career trajectory. He could you know transfer again next season with with no penalty as as a grand transfer. So maybe he sees an opportunity to you know come to state, get better, and and leave next season. You know it's it's hard to tell you know what exactly what was the thought process there. I think if you're Mississippi State, you're pumped, right? You got two guys who are you know, starting quarterbacks in the SEC with that experience. If Will Rogers goes down, you know, the past couple of years, they didn't really have a guy that could step in. Sawyer Robertson was a, a four-star prospect, but he had no experience, right? If Will Rogers got hurt, you were going to be put in a really tough spot. 
now, you know, if something happens, you, you've got options back there, right? You got a guy like Mike Wright, as you mentioned, with, with a lot of experience. So for State, it was a huge win, win to get him. And for Mike Wright, you know, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, what his career path looks like based on this decision. Now, I don't know uh, how much you've seen this or read into it, uh, but Zach Arnett, since taking over, and particularly this spring, anytime he's kind of asked about uh, the offense and how it's going to change, he, there's a lot of pushback. It, it, I, I think his point is just we're not. it's not a complete overhaul. A, a lot of the same routes and, and concepts, I guess, will, will still apply. But uh, are you are you buying that the offense is not going to be drastically different because it – it certainly looked different in the spring game to me. And, and when they came out, I always I always overreact to the first play, right? And they run the football. And I was like, it's a new day at Mississippi <laughs> State. So I, I don't know what your thoughts on that. No, I think uh, you know to some extent it will be very different, right? I mean, we we didn't see, you know, Tula Griffin come across for a jet sweep once, you know, in, in the time that they're running the air right here. So that it, it will be different. There will be a lot more runs. What it will kind of stay the same. And, um, you know, to some extent is you're kind of forced to because, a lot of the roster that comes back, you know, is a roster from last year. It's to some extent you want to keep some similarities, right? Not just have this. If you think this can be a really good year, you don't necessarily want it to just be a complete overhaul and have to start from scratch. You want to keep some of those same concepts, which, you know, that's what's kind of confused me is, is some people have given, you know, Arnett a, a tough time about going away from the air raid. And you look at Kevin Barbie's offense and you say, well, like most coaches throughout football, not just college football, you look at the NFL, you look at the high school level, there's air raid concepts in, in what they run, right? I mean, we we still haven't seen in the spring Will Rogers go under center, right? He's still been in the shotgun, okay? So we're still kind of seeing the gradual movement of, of, you know, going from the air raid to what you are now. And if Barbe thinks that, you know, his best chance to win is keeping a lot of those air raid concepts, he's going to keep them, right? So I think you're kind of looking at an offense that, yes, it'll be different. They're going to run it a lot more. But, but when you look at it from from schematics and, and kind of what, you know, they're going to set up and, and try to do, a lot of it's going to lean back on, you know, air raid concepts that coaches all around the country are still using. Yeah. Well, how about the defense where I think, uh, obviously, you know this, but people that don't pay close enough attention to Mississippi State, I mean, the defense has been holding that program together and, and in my opinion, yeah. has been the much stronger side of the ball and, and they don't win the Egg Bowl without uh, Zach Arnett and his defense. But the defense returns just 43% of their production, according to, to Bill Connolly's ESPN metrics here. That's 13th in the SEC. But they they do bring back some veterans, particularly at linebacker Watson and, and Jet Johnson and uh, Richardson at, at corner. I mean, they've got some really nice pieces. Defensive line also, they've got some veterans there. Uh, how much of a concern is it for Mississippi State to rank that low in production do you think we'll we'll have a drop off on defense, or do you got enough faith in Zach Arnett that uh, the defense will still be a solid unit? Yeah, I think the the front six slash seven of this defense will be good just because of that experience you mentioned them returning. I mean, you lose Cam Young to to the NFL draft, and, you know he's your D tackle who's kind of in there and just you know stuffs the run, and he's been a big reason why their run defense has been so good the past few years. But but I think mostly when you look at the linebackers and the defensive line, you're pretty confident with with where you are with this team. It's in the secondary where I think a lot of the concerns are, are starting to come up and maybe why a lot of that production, you know, why those produ production numbers are what they are. I mean, you lose Emmanuel Forbes, that, you know, speaks for itself, right? I mean, you're losing the pick six leader all time, you know, in college football. That's a, that's a pretty big loss, I'd say. But like you mentioned, you know, DeCamian Richardson now, he's the guy that steps up and, and he's supposed to be the number one guy, which is interesting because you look at the past couple of years, you know, Martin Emerson leaves, Emmanuel Forbes step up, steps up as the number one guy. Now Forbes leave. Richardson is going to be the guy that's expected to step up. Who steps up as the number two guy? You know, that's kind of the next question. You got, you know, guys like Isaiah Spurge who have been at Mississippi State for a while, haven't necessarily had much much playing time. Can he step up and be that guy? Or is it a transfer like Kamari Rogers, who was a four-star for Mississippi, went to Miami, now is back at Mississippi State. Is he going to step up? And then the safety is is probably where you have your biggest question mark. Sean Preston comes back, and, and he's super experienced, and people can probably remember his name from, you know, a lot of the playing time that he's had at State. But – you know, you lose Jackie Matthews Jr., who was kind of your, you know, hybrid, you know, the coaches call it, you know, different thing. It's Husky one day, one place, it's Bulldog another place. You know, you know what position I'm talking about there. Uh, and then you also lose, you know, Jalen Green and, and Colin Duncan back there. I mean, these are – you're losing a lot of experience in your secondary, which, you know, they have young players who have, you know, the the star power to be good. Like I mentioned, you got four stars back there who, who can be good. You got transfer um, – you know, Chris Keyes coming from Indiana. You got, you know, Jacoby Albert coming from Kentucky. You got a lot of players 
coming in through the portal who you can plug in and play, but they don't necessarily have the experience that you had the last couple of years. So that's what's going to be interesting is maybe the secondary isn't that great at the start of the year, and can your front kind of get you through – you know, that, that learning curve. And then when you get to the second half and, and you've, you know, got some playing time, got some experience, is that an area that you feel comfortable in when, when you get to the heart of SEC play? Well, I'm glad you referenced the transfer portal because I know you've written that here recently on the Clarion Ledger, Mississippi State, and their portal targets here. Um, and so two-part question, what positions do you think Mississippi State needs to add? And will this will they finally fix the kicking issues? After, I think they've added two kickers now via the portal. <laughs> Yeah, uh, they've got a they've got a transfer kicker from UCLA. He's been here all spring and, and he's looked pretty good. He put up some pretty impressive numbers at UCLA. Um, they just added another uh, portal kicker from uh, William and Mary transfer. Who um, you know the numbers weren't that great, but you know obviously they see something in him with, with the potential. So we'll see if Arnett's luck with the kickers is different than Mike Leach's luck with the kickers because everyone knows the the history that's there with that. Um, well, uh, the, the other question you asked about you know what they can still get in the portal, you know I think they need to do in the portal at this point is probably add to depth, right? You're not looking to necessarily find more starters right now. I think you're pretty comfortable with the 22 you've, you've got lined up right now. Um, but, but like I, like I'd written in the piece, you know, the defensive line is, is good. And, and they've, you know, put pressure on quarterbacks the, the past few years and, and they've made, you know, the, the run defense be, you know, so, so good for Mississippi state the past couple of years, but you still never, you know, really got that guy that was a, a defensive end that could really come off the edge and, and create havoc on, on any given play on a, on a third and long, you know, come in there and, and really, you know, d- destroy a play, right? It's, you, you haven't really had that yet. Can, can you go out and find something like that? Is it too late now? I mean, this the second portal window has, has not been slow, right? There, there's been players left and right, you know, going in it. Can, can you find a piece that, you know, at least gives you some more depth or – or just someone who can come off the edge and create a little more pressure. It feels like states kind of lacked that, you know, the, the last few years. So I think that's one spot where you're looking at it and saying you could use a little more depth. And I think anytime you can get depth on the offensive line, you, you take it right. I mean, the the front five that the Mississippi State's going to have um, this season is is experienced. They all come back and, and have had some playing time. But most of them, you know, starting playing time in the SEC. You feel pretty good about what you got up there, but you don't. You don't really have proven guys who can kind of step in and plug and play. Like Stephen Lasoy was that guy last year. He came from Middle, Middle Tennessee, was kind of versatile where you could play him at either of the guard positions. You could also play him at center. So, you know, when a guy like Quinston Sharp goes down, you could plug him in. When, when you know, a left guard or right guard is struggling, you can kind of plug him in. Well, now he's the starting center or will be, will be somewhere on that offensive line, you know, with Sharp leaving. Who is that next guy? Do, do you have that versatile guy who can step in and, hey, if this guy's struggling or this guy's injured, we have a plug and play type player. It doesn't feel like they necessarily have that quite yet. If you can find that in the portal, I think it's a huge gap. Let me ask you this. What do you think is the biggest question that Mississippi state had about this team that they answered in spring camp? I think the biggest question uh, from the spring camp is, you know, are you going to find ways to get to Luger from the ball? And I think that, that they've, you know, shown that they're going to do that. <laughs> you know, it's funny, like you mentioned, watch a spring and you don't want to overreact to the first play. Well, it was like the third or fourth play where they ran that, you know, reverse and around with, with Tula Griffin. And he goes 43 yards and you're thinking, all right, well, I think that Kevin Barbet and Zach Arnett knew the fans in the stands wanted to see that play. They wanted to see a handoff to Tula Griffin and they made sure that they got it, you know, right away early in that game, which also another thing that, that was kind of a big question coming into the spring is when you watch that end around, who is it that comes and seals the edge for Tulu to, to go score? It's a tight end, which we haven't seen at Mississippi State for the past three or four years, right? He, and, and that tight end was Malik Ellis, who's you know an offensive tackle, has kind of been moving the tight end. They're going to have a couple tight ends with uh, Spivey from TCU coming in, uh, Ryland Goat, I hope I pronounced that right, coming from Georgia. Um, so they'll, they'll have actual tight ends who have played tight end the past few years. Um, but but it's interesting to see, you know, right right away. Everyone wants to see Tulu with the ball in his hands. Everyone wants to see, you know, the tight ends blocking and creating plays. You saw both of that, you know, on that play. So I think, you know, the, the biggest question was how are you going to get the ball to Tulu? What are you going to do with the tight end position? The, the tight end they kind of had to manage through the spring without having, you know, a true tight end on the roster, which I think they did a good job of. Now you're going into the summer, you're bringing in some new guys, and and it's going to be interesting to see kind of how they fit into this offense. Now, similar question. What's a big question that remains after spring heading into a uh, summer and training camp? Yeah, I think the, the biggest question still remains that safety. You know, which guys are going to emerge as as the starters, which young guys are going to be prepared to start, you know, come day one and, and make a big role or make a big impact, I should say, you know, as the season rolls on. That's 
when you look at this team, it's kind of surprising that, you know, the biggest question remains on defense because of, of you know, how much change there's been on offense. But really, that's that's the spot I look at. And I say if, if Mississippi State's secondary struggles, it, it could be, you know, a down year. And if Mississippi State's secondary is good, it could be a really good year. That, that's the one area right now where I, I got the biggest question mark still. Now, last question for you, Steph. Really appreciate all your time. I've, I've got the schedule here, and a lot of people – you know, the official over-unders are not out yet, but it, it seems like they're going to be around six, six and a half. So I want to know your confidence level that Mississippi State goes over that. But let me run down this schedule real quick, which features eight home games. I think I think that's yeah. the most ever for Mississippi State. Um, they open Southeast Louisiana, Arizona at home, LSU at home week three. That's a big game at South Carolina, Alabama at home. Western Michigan at home, at Arkansas, at Auburn, Kentucky at home, at Texas A&M, and then you uh, close out Southern Miss at home, and obviously Ole Miss at home in the Egg Bowl. So what's your confidence level that this Mississippi State team can, if the number is, let's say, six and a half, that Mississippi State can go over that? Yeah, I, I actually do really believe that they'll, they'll go over that. I, I have pretty high confidence. And like you mentioned, the, the eight home games are huge, right? And, and some of those are tough. The, the LSU game is going to be really tough. Alabama is going to be really tough. Um, the road games are no cakewalk either. I mean, South Carolina having to play there is, is kind of a tough you know, crossover game to, to get, though I, I guess it's easier than having to face Georgia last season. <laughs> um, but, you know, you look at the that Kentucky series, the home team has, has dominated. you got some pretty high confidence that, you know, Mississippi State can pick that off. I mean, a and M and and I know some A and M fans won't won't be thrilled to hear it, but A and M and Jimbo haven't really showed that they can beat Mississippi State in recent years. I mean, I, I'm sure Mississippi State, you know, especially with Will Rogers, he he went into you know Kyle Station a few years ago and, and got a win. I, I'm sure he has the belief that you know he can go back to Kyle Field and and get another win there. So I, I think I think getting to seven, you know, shouldn't be too much of a problem. I think closing out those back to back home games against Southern Miss and Ole Miss is. It's kind of a good draw to you. That, that's a good way to kind of close out the, the season. I think they can be, you know, at five or six wins going into that stretch and, and kind of get over the hump to, to get to seven or eight. So I, I think they'll get to at least seven. I wouldn't be too surprised if this was an eight-win eight, eight win team again. All right, Steph, before you go, can you tell everybody where's uh, the easiest place to find all your work? You do a hell of a job covering the Mississippi State Bulldogs. Uh, let the audience know where they can find that. Yeah, our website is clearandledger.com. We have a Mississippi State tab with, with all our coverage there. And David Eckert, our Ole Miss writer, does a great job as well uh, covering the Rebels. And on Twitter, I'm at S-K-R-A-J-I-S-N-I-K-3. I really appreciate you having me on, man. I love uh, love what y'all do. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. And we'll put a link to all that in the show notes. And uh, All right, hey, I'll cut it right there. Thank you so much. All right, so just want to say thanks again to Stefan for joining the show. Always a treat. We got to hang out with him at Media Days, Shane. He says he's going to be at the next Media Days up here in Nashville. So, uh, man, I'm, I'm fired up for that. And, uh, man, I am fired up for this weekend to watch me some Alabama and LSU spring football. How about you? Yeah, see what happens down there in Miami, you know. Stay on your Twitters. And... <laughs> I may mute notifications tomorrow, Mike, because your ass is getting drugged through the mud. I can't believe you had them so low. <laughs> oh, yeah, no one's going to agree with this at all. No. But uh, that's that's half the fun of doing it. You know what? Absolutely, man. Well, I appreciate you, as always. Great week of shows here. I appreciate each and every one of you. And like I said, I mean, heck, we even got a voicemail during the show. So uh, keep giving us those at 615-965-5152. Can't wait to uh, uh, discuss more of these. Hell, they, we went damn near an hour here on this question. So yeah. some really great stuff is really going to help us during the off season. So thank you, each and every one of you who continue to uh, help support the show, we really do appreciate it. But that's going to do it for this episode of the show. We'll catch you on the next one. All right. See you guys. Go balls. How could you not have us hire? We could redo it right now, Mike. Put the balls up top where they belong. <laughs> <laughs>